So here it is, my new GT3. Now, we're gonna go into the in-depth reasons when I take you inside the car for a drive shortly as to why I've gone and bought a manual. But before I go and explain the complete irrational, rational reasons for me getting into this car, I thought I'd give you a quick tour of the unique features of this car and what sort of stands it apart on the micro details from your sort of standard GT3. So first of all, let's take a look at the outside. It's in crayon. Now, when I originally spec'd my blue, my Miami blue GT3, at that time, I was split between crayon or Miami blue. I ended up going down the Miami blue route because I wanted something sort of bright, bold and flamboyant, but I, every time I saw a crayon car, I was always like, man, was that the right choice? And I swore that if I ever got the opportunity to get into another Porsche again, it would be crayon. Lo and behold, this is the car. This was an off-market purchase. It wasn't necessarily for sale as such. It wasn't something that I found on piston heads. Uh, that is a story for another time, which I shall explain further in the video, but back to the specs. So let's start at the front of the car. So this is all about contrasts. It's got a lot of contrasting black parts that contrast with the crayon paint. Uh, crayon as well, for those of you guys on the continent, Porsche also refer to this color as chalk. So crayon and chalk, exactly the same thing. Uh, different lights, it looks different colors. Sometimes it looks quite light gray. Sometimes I've had people question, is it even an off-white? And uh, overcast, it goes full-on battleship gray. So it's a really cool color that changes in the light, even though it is a flat paint and not a metallic paint. Now if we come down, talking about black contrasting parts, uh, this has the optional LED upgraded headlights. First of all, in the dark, they are amazing. The illumination is like you've got your own sort of football field worth of lights in front of you illuminating the road. But from a design feature, uh, the housing of these lights also has this sort of black backing to it. So as you stand back from the car, it ties together all of this uh, black pack and contrasting black segments really nicely. They are also adaptive. So when you uh, press the nose lift and the nose lifts up, they level out. And when you're turning the steering wheel, the lights sort of turn with the wheel to help you around uh, tighter corners when you might be going a little bit swift at nighttime. And sticking with the theme of the black pack, we have the 20 inch wheels are now painted entirely black, which obviously ties all of this contrasting stuff together. In fact, there is somebody that does carbon in the splitter and these air intakes, which also would tie in nicely with the back. Anyway, we'll speak about that in a minute. And we've just fitted new Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s, which incidentally, while we're on it, this is the last weekend that you're able to enter the competition to join me for a ride up the Goodwood Festival of Speed hill climb. Now, at the Festival of Speed this year, Michelin have once again sponsored the supercar paddock, but this year they're going really big. I've been speaking with them over the last few weeks. I'm talking huge. It's bigger than it's ever been. Um, I've had the honor of driving up the Festival of Speed hill climb for a few years, and every time I get in that car to go up the hill, I get goosebumps. Uh, so to have the option to get you in a seat in a car with me this year uh, hit the link below and enter your email address to be drawn out of the digital hat for that experience because it, it truly is once in a lifetime i implore you to get involved so it'll be incredibly cool and we're going up uh in something very special which i shan't divulge just yet but they are shared with these wonderful tires the other features really are standard these elements here you can't actually spec in anything other than black. However, as part of the, I guess, longer term prospect of this car, I am looking to spec these in carbon and the air intakes in carbon because I just think it will look really, really cool. Anyway, the super trick stuff and bespoke options are actually on the inside. So we'll come around to the driver's side and I'll show you some of the features which have made this, or should I say almost sealed the deal on why this car was perfect for me. Now, if you remember my Miami Blue GT3, uh, it had the full Club Sport pack, but this one doesn't have a roll cage. Now, I'll wind down the window so cameraman has a bit more access. So I always had the folding sports seats. You'll notice these now have the 918 style seats. Now, uh, interesting thing to notice, on the standard fitment of the 918 seats, I always felt that they were a little bit too upright. Particularly, when weirdly, when you were wearing a helmet, it used to feel like you were sort of leaning forward and really wasn't quite right, which is odd for Porsche, first of all, because they normally get these things absolutely spot on, but also more weird for their more driver track-focused seats, that the driving position was a bit upright. So, this 
custom shims have been installed on this particular car on the driver's seat down here. Now what this has done has lowered the back and hired the front, meaning you've got more support under the thighs, your bum sits lower, and you're just generally in that sort of more racing driver position, it's perfect. But more importantly, it's also pitched the back of the seats just a little further backwards to give you that perfect pitch. When I sat in this, it was like everything was right in the world. Now, in my previous car, the reason I spec the folding buckets and not the fixed was also because I opted for the cage. The reason is you can fold them forwards and therefore you can fit stuff in the back because you otherwise had to navigate the cage. But in this, you'll notice there is no cage, which means you can slide forwards or backwards the passenger seat and then just wedge uh, your bags between these two seats. And because there's no cage there, you don't have to navigate it. You just throw it in the back. So not only is it more comfortable, the driving position is better. We've got this new pitch gym, which is also a little bit more practical while still being able to maintain these seats, which is very cool indeed. One other thing, you may or may not know that on these seats, you can remove these inserts like so. And in there is a nice custom piece of foam. Now what that does, it just contours your lower back. So it, there isn't that sort of void between seat and your back. It just cushions it perfectly. Honestly, I wish I could put every single one of you guys in this seat. It's just, it's just so nice. Okay, just before I put the insert back in, this is actually quite a cool example to show that these seats are carbon through and through. This isn't a sort of display case back. This is a full carbon seat. As you can see, after having uh, taken off the padding, you can see the back of the carbon right, right there. And these have come directly out of the 918 Spider. They are therefore referred to as 918 Spider seats. Um, aesthetically as well, that was the only thing which sort of, don't get me wrong, it didn't annoy me with the last seats, but they weren't as aesthetically glorious as these ones. These, the sculpture on them is phenomenal. But importantly, they're also lighter. Now let me also talk to you about as I stick this back in, look at that, back in there. Interestingly, by specking the car as a manual car, its foundation is already a sort of a lighter weight version of this car. A manual gearbox is much lighter than the seven speed twin clutch gearbox. There's just a lot less componentry. The gearbox is much smaller and lighter. So straight away, you're starting off with a lighter car. Then if you don't spec the cage, the cage itself, don't forget in the GT3s, isn't the titanium cage that you got in the YSARC pack. This is a steel cage. That weighs just over 20 kilograms, right? For the optimal spec and balance of this car, and this might be splitting hairs and it's the sort of thing that you might only notice on track, if you don't spec the cage, but do spec the nose lift, it takes a little bit of weight out of the rear and allocates a little bit of more weight on the front and just provides a little bit more of an optimal balance of the car. Now, I know that sounds like it's splitting hairs, but believe me, when you get these things up to maximum attack, these nuances are what make the subtle differences between things feeling extra comfortable when you're right on the edge. And that's what I'm planning on doing with this, taking it to the edge on many tracks. So let's also talk to you about the pedals. Come around here, cameraman, I shall show you these glorious aluminium pedals. Now it's not often that you look in the pedal box of a car, uh, but by standard, the pedals in a GT3, these strips here would otherwise be filled in with rubber. Normally, no problem at all. I'm sure you're familiar by now that pretty much every video that I film, it rains at some point. So I'm sure you've witness this yourself. You get into your car out of a wet and soggy road surface and you put your feet on your pedals and there's just a bit of movement because it's slippery underfoot. Now that's not so much of a problem if you're in the automatic because you're not having to heel and toe and downshift and throttle, blip, etc. But with these, you're effectively having your own little ballet dance with your feet down there. So by removing the rubber out of the pedals, you're gonna get much less slip underfoot when it's wet, of which this is rare. It, it normally is very wet here. Now interior, similar, but different to my original GT3. Obviously the biggest difference is we have one of these on the central console. We'll get onto that when we go for a drive in a minute. But equally the seats, I'm not sure if you can tell here, but just how 
Honestly, the driving position is amazing. It's just right. It's pitched back it enough here that you're lent back it enough. Honestly, this is no exaggeration. The standard seats without the shims in to give that pitch feels like the equivalent of that. Obviously, it's not quite as dramatic as that, but it feels like that, really upright. And your helmet always used to sort of bash there, but this now, the tweaks are spot on. So that's very cool. Um, we don't have the yellow contrast stitching anymore, but we do have yellow seat belts to tie in with the yellow brake calipers of the carbon ceramics on the outside. One modification I would also like to make is the 12 o'clock marker on the steering wheel. Now, this isn't the fault of anyone. You could only spec that on UK GT3s as red. There was no PTS option or basically any options on GT3s, which was a shame. But with these yellow and the calipers yellow, I would really like the 12 o'clock marker yellow. So maybe once I've applied lots of dead skin cells onto this lovely Alcantara, maybe we'll retrim the wheel at some point and then put a 12 o'clock marker on it. You might quite rightly be thinking, yeah, but how long are you gonna keep this car for? I mean, I don't exactly have the greatest track record of keeping a car for a long time. That's definitely a topic for when we go for a drive. Speaking of which, I should probably indulge you in what this thing of those three pedals are like on the road. motorsport this thing through and through the engine is berserk and it's funny because you have to control it more it feels like a ball of energy in your hands quite a lot more actually than the PDK version did because that was so effortless on the track a lot more efficient so excited so excited I've just come off the back of gumball um, as much fun as I was having there I couldn't wait to get back to this car this is actually the day that I've collected it and instead of doing the whole handover video at the dealership I just thought look let's just jump straight to it uh, let's not beat around the bush now why the swap from the same car with a different gearbox well I absolutely love or loved my Miami Blue GT3 as a package phenomenal it ticks so many boxes but the result of this thing, this single stick down here, the three pedals down there, is actually somewhat of my own fault. You see, I've started a series on this channel called the Modern Classic Series. The majority of those cars that I have driven have been manual, and even though I learned to drive, and grew up driving manual cars, because I've spent a lot of my own time in twin clutch cars, I sort of, I guess, lost touch really with the enjoyment of how marvelous it is to enjoy the purity of a manual gearbox. It's absolutely fantastic, particularly if you find yourself on an empty, windy road, take the Alps, for example. But if you wanna take a car for a drive and simply enjoy the cliche of man and machine, there is no substitute for a manual gearbox. And it's taken my own modern classic series, so this is my own fault, taking my own series to just allow me to reconnect with what that feeling is like. And interestingly, of all of the cars that I filmed on that series, you might expect it to be something like the uh, 997 GT3 RS 4 litre that had me thinking about a manual gearbox again. Whereas in actual fact, it was the manual Aston Martin DBS. <laughs> I know that's such an unlikely character, of a car to reinvigorate uh, my appreciation for manual gearboxes. But hear me out. What was really highlighted to me was not how enjoyable it was going fast. It was actually how much of the engagement was retained when you were going slow. You see, with this, I can heel and toe and execute the perfect downshift when I'm approaching traffic lights or a T-junction. I can enjoy that interaction with the gearbox and it was the time spent in the Aston Martin DBS that made me reappreciate just how great manual gearboxes were when you were going slow. Now look, I live in England. I don't know whereabouts the majority of you guys are watching from, but the more time that I spend on the road in the UK, the more I'm reminded how fast you can't go. Whereas right now, look at that. Just lovely blip of the heel, rolling it over onto the throttle pedal as I'm gracefully 
downshifting and applying some pressure on the brakes. I've had an interaction and an engagement with this car at a very pedestrian speed. Now don't get me wrong, this thing does not hang around. When you get up it, it still has the 500 horsepower, it still has that 9,000 RPM redline, and it's still rocking those carbon ceramic brakes. So it has all of the componentry and formula to still go absolutely ballistic, should you want to. But I drive mostly this car, or my GT3, in England. And it's this modern classic series and these wonderful analog cars which are sadly beginning to slowly die out. We are seeing somewhat of a rebirth of them, don't get me wrong. But in the mainstream, these things, they're becoming a, a niche prospect. Now of course we have classic cars, modern classics, which still have manual gearboxes, but the modern manual is becoming, well, rarer and rarer and I just wanted to experience it for myself and I've been going round and round in my head. I was even this close to buying a manual Aston Martin DBS and to be honest with you I still am. However, I sat in my own automatic PDK GT3 and I thought, you know what? This thing with a manual gearbox, Porsches do manuals probably better than anyone else in the world. Why don't I just maintain the same formula with three pedals and a stick? And so here we are. just 
you don't have to go quite as fast in this thing. As always guys, thanks so much for watching, and I shall see you next time.